Hello music lovers, welcome back. Music maker or otherwise, creative people have this habit of sabotaging their own work. Why is this? Well, it turns out there's a fundamental medical excuse underneath all of it, which I'd like to make you aware of today. So you can consider this video a kind of doctor's note for why you can't finish that track today. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do a check on a few symptoms, shall we? Writer's block. How about that one? Have you ever had it? Of course you have. Yes, that's one. Or how about this scenario? You're using your laptop on a plane and the plane hits turbulence. So you close the laptop. I bet that one's happened to you. Or here's an easy one. Let me guess, you're more scared of sharks than you are cows or deer. Correct, yes? Strange line of questioning for a music video, isn't it? Well, bear with me. It turns out all these things are related. For you see, cows and deer kill more people than sharks do. And we know that turbulence doesn't ground planes. And we certainly know that closing your laptop doesn't magically keep the plane from falling out of the sky. These are irrational behaviors that we can't control. And when it comes to writer's block, it turns out that's also irrational. But we'll come back to that one later. So what's going on here? Well, it's all down to this thing, the amygdala. In my last video on finishing stuff, I briefly touched on the role of fear. Here is what I was alluding to. This tiny part of the brain, the amygdala, is the bit we share most with wild animals. This thing is hardwired to your nervous system. It controls you at the most fundamental level. If someone throws a rock at your face, the big rational part of your brain might start to try and calculate the trajectory of the rock. But this thing calls rank and says, no, I'm in charge now. We're going to duck right away and takes over. We don't get any say in that decision. You may have also heard this part of the brain referred to as the chicken brain or the lizard brain. And full disclaimer, credit where it's due. This entire video's idea was spawned by one of the talks from Seth Godin entitled Quieting the Lizard Brain. The job of the amygdala is survival and it's damn good at it. We've survived over 10 million years as a species so far, thanks to this. It is scared, it is horny, and it is hungry. That's all it knows. You've probably heard of the concept of fight or flight response. Well, that's this. That weird high-pitched scream you made when you walked into a spider web that made you sound like a 10-year-old girl. Yeah, you don't get to choose that noise. <laughs> that's the amygdala. That thing takes over when we seem to be in danger. Seem being the operative word here. The problem is, it doesn't actually know. Knowing is the job of the bigger brain, but the big brain is slow. So the fast but dumb amygdala takes over when we might be in danger. Now, in the modern world, we have different worries than running from saber-toothed tigers. We've invented things like jobs and the concept of social status. And the unfortunate situation now is that little peanut brain is still sat there with a hotline straight to our nervous system. And it doesn't know whether you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger or whether you're just scared of being laughed at when you're about to show someone your art. It's all the same to the amygdala and it's going to take over your mind and body until it feels safe again. So writer's block, or in fact, why you're putting off clicking that export button. Same thing. Successful author Stephen King famously believed writer's block doesn't exist. And many studies have also supported this. Although I like Seth Godin's explanation the best. He said, nobody gets talker's block. We're all fine spouting thousands of words every day but it's only when it comes to write them down that there's an issue. It was all fun and games working on that track just an hour ago. In fact, you were dancing around the room. The groove was so good. But now, if you hit export and release that track, suddenly that's it. As Steve Albini once said, it's like a fart. You can't recall it and your name is on it and the world will deal with it as it sees fit. That's why as soon as you even think about going towards that export button, the voice in your head gets louder. A voice Stephen Pressfield gave a name to, the resistance. 
it's really easy to be convinced by the resistance because it sounds just like us. It says things like, I've just realized I haven't panned any tracks yet, or it's too simple and I can't think of what else it needs right now. It's not good enough yet. I should get feedback first. I should start a course just in case I'm missing something. I should master this track before it goes out, right? I don't know enough about mastering. Let me jump on YouTube. Surely I need a label to put this out, right? I think I'll get in trouble. This sounds too close to my favorite track. Maybe real analog gear would sound better than these plugins. Famous person X is already 15 years ahead of me. I can't catch up. Sound familiar? <laughs> yes, I think we've all had some of those. What's happening here is your amygdala is kicking in and your rational brain has given it a voice to justify the anxiety. Stephen Pressfield's book is called The War of Art because there is no way to shut down the amygdala. So this is indeed a war every time. So what can we do about it? Again, more wise words from Seth. We can't turn it off, but we can dance with it. When the voice turns up, we can instead recognize its presence and know that it's there for a reason. The reason it's there is because you are unsure and you are unsure because this is art. There are no right answers. The lizard brain would be quiet if you were doing something perfectly safe. Now in the world of music, perfectly safe means boring, means done before. So when the voice turns up, when you are about to click export, that's actually an indicator that you are on to a good thing. Okay, so we understand the underlying theory now. Let me give you some practical tips on how I dance with the resistance in my day to day. This is my Steam game library. I'm not too proud to admit there's over 600 games here. All these games to choose from. And instead, I just go back to playing these three. <laughs> Why is that? Simple, it's choice paralysis. I have been in the situation after working at the studio, taking so long to decide what game to play that I end up just going to bed. <laughs> Yet when it comes to music, I can at least finish a track a day or sometimes multiple. Why is that? Well, by contrast, here's my plugin library. You'll find only one or two options in most of these folders. It didn't always look this neat, of course, especially when I was a Waves user <laughs> or UAD, especially when I was first starting out and my friend handed me one of those magic CDs that had every program and every plugin on it. I certainly didn't get anything finished in those days. <laughs> so the lesson here is scope. This incredible technology opens up so many possibilities and then gives us extra possibilities to go with our possibilities. <laughs> so a great way of calming the amygdala is to reduce our scope, reduce our options. We can do this in several areas. First of all, expectations. Just like my music, before starting this channel, I had no idea if it was going to work. That's how art works. It might not work. But luckily, others who've come before me have some reliable data. I knew from watching Ali Abdul that my first 100 videos would suck. <laughs> and on average, it takes about that many to get your first 1,000 subscribers. I already knew I would only have time for one video a week. So the first task is simple. Can I manage one video a week for two years? That is it. I knew they wouldn't be good. <laughs> so it simply becomes, can I learn how to make them? And can I put them out at a rate of one a week? And that's why I didn't quit after making my 60th or 70th video and they still weren't getting any views because I knew that was not the purpose of the first 100 videos. Also, decisions within that process, like not having my face on camera, help satiate the lizard brain. Not because I'm embarrassed, it's just much easier and quicker when I don't have to shave or tidy up. <laughs> Over at edmprod.com, they show this handy little five-stage development idea for the average EDM producer. Your initiation and experimentation phases are going to take a good couple of years. 
if you go to university to learn music production. Most people will say that's only the beginning, and that will take you three years. And we know from the 10,000 hours rule that it's going to be five to 10 years to really get good at it. So don't be expecting to produce Eric Prydz's Opus as your first track. The tracks in your first couple of years are definitely going to suck, but you should finish them anyway for the reason I outlined in the first video. Practice finishing. The more you get used to clicking that export button, the less scary it becomes. Another way we can reduce scope is to know what our role is. Many newcomers excited to get into music production don't actually realize music production has become an umbrella term these days. Music production encompasses all kinds of roles and one person trying to do them all at once is usually disastrous. As I outlined in my You Are Not A Producer video, many music producers don't understand that they are not producing and without realizing it, will find themselves engineering or writing when they should be producing. So knowing what hat you're wearing and sticking to it is a great way of limiting your options, or should I say, focusing your options. This brings us neatly onto the concept of process purpose. When you understand what the roles are, you can break up your sessions into different purposes. To bring back my game analogy again, as much as you'd love it to be the case, your first game is not going to be something like GTA in Unreal Engine. It's more likely to be Pac-Man in Godot. <laughs> and even then, you wouldn't aim to make the whole game. First of all, you have to learn how to make that sprite move left and right. Same in music. You might spend your first four months just sweeping an EQ up and down, training your ears on what frequencies are contained in different sounds. I like to call these sandbox sessions. Even this far into my career, I still do them. Just a few weeks ago, Variety of Sound put out a new plugin, and I'm always interested in his work. So I set aside a few hours just to play with that. And when I sat down for that session that evening, I know the purpose of that session was not to make a track. I am there just to play with a reverb and get used to it, and ultimately deciding if I think it's worth adding to my list of possibilities. Another reason I might sit down is to make plots. This is how a lot of my genre studies go. The purpose of those sessions is just to pull in and study lots of references, try to recreate some key parts, which builds me a library of MIDI and presets. Then when it does come down to making a track in that session, even if I'm feeling creatively bankrupt, I will have a bunch of sounds and parts ready to go and I can just play Legos, plugging in the bits I like. So my advice is allow yourself sandbox time. You might be right at the beginning, just playing with all those knobs on a compressor, trying to figure out what they do, or watching a YouTube tutorial. Make that evening just for that. Don't try turn it into anything. And then on the next session, maybe you will make some synth presets or Go around the web, collecting as many free synth presets as you can and auditioning them into a list of favorites, etc, etc. Split it up and take the pressure off yourself. So by the time you do sit down to make a track, all of your tools and parts will be in place, focusing your options and making it quicker, simpler and easier. This should make the resistance a lot quieter. Lastly, why not learn from the fathers of house? Like Frankie Knuckles, they managed to change the world with just a four track tape machine, a drum machine, a pair of decks and a single synth. There's no more stark lesson than this. It goes to show how overwhelmed with technological possibilities we are today. The likes of Frankie didn't consider this equipment a limitation. They were so excited at the possibility of being able to make their own track for the first time that this was their world of possibilities. Why not do the same? Limit yourself to a generous eight tracks in your DAW. Limit your effects to just EQ, filter, delay, and reverb. Use and abuse samples if you're too slow with MIDI. Copy simple arrangements like odd mobs left to right. And set yourself a time limit on how long the session will be. Another great way to satiate the lizard brain is to do things quickly and not give it long enough to speak up. One of the most convincing and logical arguments from the resistance is I can't release it because I'm still improving. Good point, very true. 
but the fact is we never stop improving. I know if I come back to this script tomorrow, it will be better. Or if I come back to my track with fresh ears, I will always notice something I can improve on. So here's the paradox. If that track is always going to be better tomorrow, when is it done? The answer is never. As Da Vinci is credited as saying, art is never finished, only abandoned. So you just have to be brave and pick your own deadline. All we can do as artists is show the world where we're at right now. And my last tip, of course, is always, if you found it helpful, show me your appreciation. Press some buttons or leave me a comment or question. Or you can always buy me a coffee with the link in the description. And until next week, I'll see you in the comments. Bye-bye.